All right, everybody, we're back with another episode of the Left Right Left podcast. I am still your handsome host, Mark R. Chabot, the Silver Fox, broadcasting from Prince William County, Virginia. Let's go. We got a great episode going tonight. One quick housekeeping note before we start. We got some exciting developments on the sponsorship side. I can't unleash that quite yet because I got to wait for this to come to fruition. But nevertheless, it sounds like we are going to have heavy sponsorship and the podcast is continuing to grow. And the first thing I want to do is just say thank you to each and every one of you out there who believe in the show, believe in me. And we're going to continue to pay it forward. Okay, that's my only note. So let's go. Tonight's guest. So I met this woman on LinkedIn. She happens to be the very first female Marine that I've had on this podcast. And she's the fourth female guest I've had overall. But I'm excited to have her. She's bold. She's brave. She's exceptional. She is just breaking apart, you know, the traditional way of, you know, transition and career and change. And she's got a lot of experience and a lot of things to offer you. And we're going to pay it forward with this episode. Without further ado... Welcome, my friend, who I happen to serve with at Quantico and didn't know it until we did a warm up, Talia Bastian Ray. Welcome, <laughs> oh. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here. And that was quite a hell of an introduction. So thanks so much. Hope hey, I live up to the hype. <laughs> not too bad for a retired star sergeant. Not too bad at all, man. Normally we screw it up, right? <laughs> I don't know about that, but it sounded great. Cool. Thank you, Tally. I appreciate it. All right, a little bit about, you know, your background and where you're from and, you know, your upbringing and all those good things. Yeah, all the things. Well, I am a Southern California girl, born and raised. Um, I actually grew up around the Long Beach area in Southern California. Oldest of four kids. Um, I have two younger brothers and a younger sister who is adopted from China. Um, I was homeschooled growing up. So, you know, did the distance learning thing before it was cool. And, uh, you know, you had to worry about... CPS being called on you in the 90s. <laughs> um, yeah, but because like I was, yeah, right. But because I was homeschooled, um, I was able to graduate from high school early, which then ultimately allowed me to graduate from college early. And, you know, I like to tell people I wasn't, you know, a brilliant kid or anything like that. I actually hated school. I did well in it, but I hated it so much. I asked my parents, like, how can I get this shit done as quickly as possible, essentially? Mm -hmm. um, and so they helped me figure out a way to test out, a, out of a lot of classes and AP courses are basically the same as like college general ed courses. And so we were able to do a lot of dual credit. And anyway, all that to say, uh, I was able to graduate early, um, which then ultimately allowed me to commission in the Marine Corps at the ripe old age of 20. Um, why would you, why would you, yeah, um, so it was, right. it's like the follow the, like the interjection question for this is like, you know, you're homeschooled, you got good family and everything, you know, you're obviously pretty dang smart to graduate from college early, all those good things. Like what the heck made you decide to leap right in and commission in the Marine Corps? I mean, I don't get it. What's what happened? Yeah. No, it's, you know, it's interesting. I, and I'm going to show my age here, but I was really young when 9-11 happened. I was seven and oh, wow. it left a really indelible impression, impression on me. Um, I remember, you know, it happened on a Tuesday and my family and I went to church the next day and I remember it was packed. And I just remember there were adults crying and like full grown men just like prostrate on the floor sobbing. Yeah. And, you know, in my seven year old brain, I just... I felt like powerless to do anything. And I, I knew that there were good guys and there were bad guys and, you know, the, the good guys took a hit and I wanted to be a part of like getting back at the bad guys. Like that's how my seven year old brain kind of conceptualized everything. Sure. And I just kind of tucked it away and never really thought about, thought about it again. Um, I was also super competitive growing up, you know, I was in sports, I was in soccer, I was a swimmer. And, um, I always had an athletic bend and for whatever reason, I think those two things combined just really drew me toward the Marine Corps. I never considered any other branch when I thought about military service, it was always the Marine Corps. And I remember telling my mom when I was like 13 or 14, you know, I just, I want to know if I could do Marine Corps boot camp. And she's like, why? I'm like, just you know, to see if I can do it. So I don't know if that means I've got like a masochistic bend and, you know, a little bit of patriotism <laughs> sprinkled in or what the percentage breakdown is. But I think just being super competitive and then also, you know, being so uh, affected by 9-11 when I was getting ready to graduate from college, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I was an English and communications major. 
but I didn't know what that meant. I, I didn't know if, you know, I was going to go work in journalism or, or politics or whatnot at the time. And I thought again about the Marine Corps. Oddly enough, I was sitting, I'll, I'll never forget. I was sitting on the floor of my bedroom, like typing up one of my final papers and the thought, like, what are you going to do after you graduate? Like just came into my brain. Yep. I thought about the Marine Corps. And so I did what, you know, a millennial does. I started Googling and, uh, I, <laughs> I found a documentary, you know, making Marine officers on YouTube. And it was like a 90 minute documentary. And I was, I was done. I was like bought in oh, hooks and sinkers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 100%. It's like, oh, this elite organization. And, um, I remember I went downstairs and my mom was making dinner that night. And I was like, so I figured out what I'm going to do after college. And she's like, oh yeah, what's that? I'm like, I'm going to join the Marine Corps and become an officer. And I remember she literally like stopped shopping and she just looked up at me and she's like, no, you're not. And um, I did. So, <laughs> you know, I feel like the most surefire way to get me to do something is to tell me I can't do it or, you know, yeah. I've got that competitive streak. So, yeah, that's how I joined the Marine Corps. Yeah. Tell everybody um, um, a little bit about, you know, your service, what you did in the Marine Corps, you know, how long you're in uh, before we start talking about kind of the main topic of this evening, which would be transition and kind of moving forward. Go ahead. Yeah. So I was in the Marine Corps for a total of six years and I had a very different experience than I think a lot of my peers did during that time. So I was in garrison the whole time, never deployed. Um, and I was in the National Capital Region for that entire time. So my MOS was adjutant 0180, and then they later reclassified it to a manpower officer. So 0102. Right. And I was stationed um, at a battalion, and then I was stationed up at the base, the installation level. Um, and from there, I went to Fort Meade, where I was also at another battalion um, embedded with within the NSA. And that whole experience was very interesting to me, because unlike a lot of my peers who went straight to the fleet, I was the only member of my TBS class to get stationed in the NCR. And so, whereas a lot of my peers... We're dealing with, you know, company grade or excuse me, dealing with captains and, and majors. I was dealing with lieutenant colonels, colonels, general officers. And so the perspective of leadership that I got as a young Marine officer very early on in my career was much more senior. And then, of course, you know, being in the National Capital Region, there's SESs and there's dignitaries and, you know, all these municipalities that are just around all the time. Um, so the flavor of leadership that I got was very different than I think um, a lot of my peers were exposed to, the proximity that I had. Um, and it just, it did a lot to hone and shape my overall leadership philosophy just from a very, very young age, such that by the time I got out at 26, you know, I felt like I already had like this whole career and all of this leadership exposure by proxy just because I had the opportunity to work with so many senior officers. Yeah. No, that, so that, that was yeah. my career. <laughs> that's that's good. Like rubbing elbows, you know, with more senior people, you get, you know, more just more more in depth and more more depth to each topic that you talk about and the affairs that are going on around you. Just it builds like a lot of maturity in you. So I agree I totally agree with you on that one. Um Tally and I Yeah, I think I, you just see things at a higher level. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, Tally and I I, I, wore, I wore this for you tonight, Talia. That's my Macaf Quantico shirt for you that's the logo <laughs> to refresh your memory you know and burn your brain a little bit but like oh poor McCaff <laughs> but uh we served together she was <laughs> oh, uh, Marine Corps Base Quantico adjutant when I was uh the star sergeant over at the air station on Quantico and she did a great job supporting us so appreciate you Talia for doing that taking care of my people too thanks I tried yeah you did <laughs> you did a good job all right, man. So you got your DD-214 in hand and it is time to go. And that right there is a frightening experience for itself. So the first thing I want to do is kind of touch a little bit upon the topic that a lot of people don't really want to talk about. And I think you and I can have a good conversation about it. Um, a lot of times the transition, you hear, you know, the grass is so green the other side, everything's so wonderful, you're going to make all this money and, you know, you're going to, your life is going to improve, you know, so much. And I think that's kind of the you know, the check in the box thing to do, you know, us as Marines are pretty macho, you know, we, little, little ego on us. And we never want to admit, you no. know, that times are tough. Never. <laughs> well, every, every day is a, every day is a great day, you know, beautiful day, everything. Right. 
Uh, mm-hmm. The reality is that when either when you get out, you know, even after six years or you retire like I did, there's a lot of feelings and a lot of emotions. There's withdrawals. You know, there's like depression and it can get really, really bad. I'm not saying that's the case for you, but I'm just sort of being open about it rather than just saying every day is great. So tell everybody a little bit about kind of your transition out the na- National Capital Region area and sort of the emotions you were feeling. Yeah. Well, in in full transparency, I went into the Marine Corps knowing that it was going to be a short term gig. Um, I had originally planned for four years. I ended up staying for six because I ended up getting my master's degree and doing a service service extension. So I didn't have to, you know, pay tuition, and all the things. Um, when I was getting out, I was definitely terrified. And it's interesting. There's so many emotions that go through you during the transition process. I literally thought I was going to be homeless and live in my car. I remember my car had been totaled only a few months prior to my transition. Thank you, Maryland drivers. Um, (laughs) But my car had been totaled. And um, one of the considerations that I, I took with me to the dealership was, can I afford this car payment on like a waitress's salary. And that's kind of where my mindset was, you know, I had been a waitress before in, in, you know, high school, college kind of a thing. And I was like, I know I can do that. I can probably get a job as a waitress, but that just goes to show you where my mindset was at as, you know, a college graduate with a master's degree, a TSSAI clearance, you know, six years in the Marine Corps as an officer, like a really good resume. I had all the things going for me. And yet internally there was this, this doubt, like, am I going to be okay? Yeah. So the transitioning service members, you know, I totally understand to a degree, obviously I wasn't in like for 20 plus years, the way that you were, but even after six years, I can completely understand how scary it is when you're faced with like this whole new world that has continued moving on without you. And here you are like trying to catch up and, and fit in and acclimate and all the things. It's a really scary experience. Yeah. It can be for sure. Um, yeah, it's an interesting um, experience. And again, I think it's just a matter of you're in the you're you're in the club. You are in the club, and and you have ride or dies that are left and the right of you at all times. And just there's always somebody to lean on. There's always a mission, you know, in front of you. And then when you get out or you retire, it sort of just goes dark and blank. And you just sometimes it just takes a little while to define. And what a perfect lead in this is for the next thing we'll talk about. Uh, You just have to find that passion, that purpose for the next thing, you know, because you ain't going back in the Marine Corps anymore and you're not going back in the military. You just have to go find it and you have to get after it. So for you, that took a little bit of time like it does for most of us. And you started out um, as a contractor. And and, and again, not to put your business out there, but just Tally was making really good money, doing a really good job up here in the NCR you know, and just something was missing. Can you walk everybody a little bit through that? Yeah, absolutely. So as you alluded to, you know, I did what everyone does getting out of the military in the national capital region. I found a government contracting job and I ended up doing a job that was pretty much exactly what I was doing on active duty, just in a civilian capacity and getting paid way more money to do it. Right. And so with the performance mindset that I brought in, you know, from the Marine Corps into the civilian world, I checked all the boxes, right? It's like make six figures, check, you know, live in a really nice apartment, check. I was single at the time. So like I had all the freedom, check, you know, it's just, I had all the things going for me, leadership position, title, access, check, 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 check. And um, that worked. I want to reiterate that that worked until it didn't. And everyone has a different point where it stops working. For me, that was about two years in. And this seems to be like a recurring theme that I hear amongst a lot of transitioning service members. You know, we're taught that the military transition occurs in three phases, right? Like pre-transition, mid, and then post. There's a fourth phase that no one talks about. And I call that the identity crisis, right? So two years in, I start feeling really frustrated, really numb, really, um, functionally depressed, quite honestly, where, you know, it would take me an hour to write a five minute email. Everything was dumb. Everything was stupid. And it made no sense because on paper I had everything going for me. I worked from home at an amazing team. I worked for a great company. I had, I was making stupid money. Like there was no reason on paper why I should have been as 
frustrated and as depressed as I was, but I was, and I couldn't deny it anymore. And it's interesting because like the more I resisted it, the worse it got. So I got to this point where I was like, I can't keep doing this. And it's interesting because I felt really trapped because I was already doing the job that I was qualified for. I already had the dream job that everyone would have killed to have. So where do you go from there? Right? Like, do you yeah. leave the security of what you know to risk it at a different company? Okay, maybe you make like five, 10, 15 grand more. Is it worth it for the unknown? What if you walk into a toxic leadership or work culture, right? So right. I felt really trapped because there was there was no way out. I was already doing the thing that I was qualified and conditioned to do. Sure. And so I had to really get honest with myself kind of for the first time in my life to be like, what do I want? Not what should I want, not what could I do, not what is expected of me as a, you know, quote unquote, former Marine officer. What do I want? And it was really the first time in my life that I let it all come out. Like I started writing and journaling. I started doing that process without judging the what came out or trying to solve for that problem in the, in the midst of writing. Cause that's what we do as humans, right? Like we're trying to problem solve as we're like processing and you can't do it that way. Right. Like you have to process and then problem solve. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wrote things out, like I want to make an impact. I want to have a podcast. I want to do public speaking. I want to write, I want to coach people or not. I want to, you know, help people work through their problems. You know, I just started writing all of these things and I had no idea how I was going to set about doing that. And I wrote it all down on a piece of paper. I tucked that piece of paper away for about six months. And then a few months after that, um, I was having lunch with a friend of mine. I was complaining to her essentially about all the things. And she just looked at me and she was like, you know, I feel like you'd be a really good executive coach. And I looked at her and I said, great. What is that? I had no idea. I'd never heard about coaching, you know, outside of a sports context, obviously, um, but she started telling me a little bit about it. And I was like, huh, that sounds really interesting. So I go home and again, do what millennials do. I start Googling and uh, everything that I found about coaching just totally aligned to everything that I wrote down on that piece of paper. And so then I was like, well, now I'm starting to see the values mismatch in what it is that I'm doing day to day and what it is that I'm actually good at, the things that I'm actually passionate about. And I'm not doing any of those things in my nine to five. So then it became a matter of like, well, how am I going to do this thing and make it my bread and butter? And yeah. that's honestly the thing I've been on ever since. I don't know if we want to get into it or, you know, that whole thing, yeah. but it's been a journey since making that discovery. Yeah. Just to be clear with everybody, you know, Talia was making, you know, double the median income in the city of Alexandria, um, doing very well for stuff. It just, it takes a lot of courage to do what you did and, you're right. It's very, it's very difficult to leave, you know, the comfort of, you know, of your environment and then go out there and just pull that lever hard. And you know that when you pull that lever like that and you go in a different direction, that very rarely is it seamless and it's just very, very fluid and no problem. And, you know, you're making the same money. There's a lot of risk that's associated with it. But to me, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, passion and, you know, an excitement in your life and doing the things that you want to do is worth that small period of discomfort before you go find, you know, that next thing that gets you energized and gets you motivated. So good on you, man. Tell everybody a little bit about kind of when you said, you know what, I'm done. Two weeks notice are in. I'm moving somewhere else and I'm going to go start my LLC. I'm going to go meet my now husband who bringing, you know, and just things are lining up for you. But I know it wasn't all a rose garden either. Tell everybody a little bit about it. No, not at all. So, um, <laughs> it was, I like to do things, you know, really hard and all the, I just go all in kind of a thing. I don't know why I do that to myself, but yeah, my, right. my husband and I that's met we while we were in Alexandria. <laughs> that's, you know, it's just in my DNA, but, um, my husband and I met when we were in Alexandria and, you know, he was around, we were dating at the time when I was wrestling with all of this. Um, and right around the time that we were getting married is kind of when I hit that breaking point. And so two weeks after our wedding, we moved to Nashville, Tennessee, which is where we now live. And three months after that, with his support, I quit my job on a Friday. So I had put in my two weeks, but my last day was on a Friday. And that next Monday, I literally sat down unemployed for like the first time in my life. I've been working since I was 13 years old. 
the first time in my life. And I literally started Googling how to file an LLC. Like I had no mm -hmm. idea how to yeah. start a business. Um, and it, it's worth noting too, that I had planned on building my coaching business concurrently while working my nine to five. And at the time I was so burnt out and I was so steeped in a fear of what other people would think that I couldn't do both at the same time. I think, you know, two, two and a half years removed from that experience, I advise people differently, right? But you don't know what you don't know. And so I felt like I was in this binary equation where it was either or. And I like to reiterate to people that it does not have to be either or. Yeah. And it, that's not my experience. Now. I was self-employed, you know, running my own coaching business, working with, you know, high profile clients within the first year, which is amazing. And I threw myself like totally into that business. But a year in, you know, my husband wanted to go through his own career change and we couldn't swing that, you know, for both of us pursuing different careers at the same time. So I had an opportunity to present itself where I got back into government consulting. The only difference being that they were fully on board with me running my business concurrently. It was a very open discussion. The energy that I went into that job with, it was totally different. And I've been able to make that work for over a year now. So what I like to tell people is once you've narrowed in on your passion and this new purpose post military service, don't feel like you have to just like set fire to the life that you had before. Like we're all adults. We have non-negotiables. There's children and bills and all the things, right? You have to find a way to pivot toward your new purpose while still being a responsible adult. And I think that that's absolutely possible. And that's what I hope my clients do today. Yeah, I tell you, like it's all resonating like really, really well with me. And it's all things I think that a lot of us, you know, we just have a hard time. We struggle with it's just I say that sometimes that the Marine Corps and DOD just has a way of sort of saying, like, these are the things that you need to do. And they don't really talk about the out of the box things that many of us are capable of doing. And that's that's important. Like we should talk a little bit more about business, talk a little bit more about LLCs, talk about things outside of just, you know, go out, get a job and then life is great. Right. Yeah. Other options as workshops and things that we can do. But, hey, you know what? At the end of the day, you can't rely upon an institution, an organization to do that for you. Like you have to take that ownership of it. Mm -hmm. And anything that's worth doing will require a lot of effort as well. So I, yeah. the, the other part, Talia, that I'll say is that, and again, this isn't quite on topic of what we're talking about, but it's an important point, is that I think a lot of veterans just assume that things are just going to fall in their lap and everything is going to line up for them. And that's just not the way that it is. The same attributes and character traits and the work ethic that you had in the military is the same thing that's going to make you successful as a civilian. Nobody's going to give you shit. Nobody is going to give you nothing. You just have to go out there and you got to earn it and you got to go out there and blaze your own path. Sorry. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said too for clinging too tightly to your military identity once you've made that transition right. into the civilian sector, right? And I think the military, in particular the Marine Corps, does a very bad job at this and in preparing Marines to make that transition because the reality is you should start preparing for that transition essentially the moment that your feet are on those yellow footprints, it should be a thought in the back of your mind that this isn't going to be forever. And I think the, the Marine Corps in particular does such a great job at like breaking down your civilian identity, you know, building you back up as a Marine, yeah. but then they forget to like break that Marine image down to then prepare you for the civilian world so that you can go forth and be successful. And what I've seen, unfortunately, so met so many times is you have these guys and these gals who still completely identify with the military, you know, like they're constantly looking backwards, their their best days are behind them, their best friends are in the past, right? And they're taking all the trauma that they experienced as well. And they're taking it with them into their future. And they never fully make the leap. They never fully pivot. They never fully acclimate. And so you can see them kind of caught between these two identities. Yeah. And they don't know who they are without the military. And I always try to tell people, like, there's a difference between being insanely proud of your military service. It is incredibly noble. It is incredibly worthy. And hopefully it is not only who you are and not only who you become, right? Right. 
there's duality there. And I don't think the military does a great job of preparing people to make that leap. So you see this in veterans who get out and start applying to jobs, right? And their resume is just inundated with military jargon, right? No one understands what they're saying. They comport themselves like the Marine, the Marine officer, or, you know, the Marine enlisted, they talk like a Marine, you know, but they're not in the Marine Corps. So it doesn't, it doesn't match like, and people are confused by it. And I think if we're being honest, deep, deep down, they're confused by it too. And so that really breaks my heart as well. And it's something that I try to work with my clients a lot of the time with is, you know, who are you? Who is Mark? without the Marine Corps, you know, who is Joe, who is Jan without the military, because that person is worthy too. And they didn't go away just because you were wearing a uniform. Right. So that's, that's not a popular message, but I think it contributes to a lot of the mental health crises that we see in our veterans after they transition as well. Yeah, because the Marine Corps, like, you know, again, forgive forgive my viewers, uh, we're just talking because we're both Marines. Um, The Marine Corps becomes, you know, who we are, becomes our identity, it becomes, you know, the thing that we do every day. And a lot of times we just forget who we are and the things that we're passionate about and also what other skills that we're good at. So Mm -hmm. those are great talking points, um, um, Talia. Now, you're a life coach. Um, coach of coach of all trades, you know, uh, that's what you're doing now currently. So I, I just wanted to challenge you a little bit on this, not in a way of not challenge you, like in a way of disagreement, but challenge you in a way to what other people think about life coaches. So mm-hmm. for instance, many of my friends, like, why would I invest money, you know, into a life coach? Because I can Google it. I can read a book, you know, I've done this in this career field for this long, um, there's all these reasons on why they just wouldn't take a step, you know, to talk into someone, you know, like you, um, why would you tell them like, it's a good idea, you know, to, to, to have a life coach? Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say, and I, I do say this to people is clearly if we're having a conversation, right? Like if we're having a call, there's something in your life that isn't working quite the way you hoped it would. Right. And so, the way that you're doing things, the way that you're thinking about it, the the problem, right, is not working for you because then you wouldn't be having a conversation with me, right? So like the first challenging question I would ask is, how's that working out for you? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and be yeah. really honest with your answer. The second thing I would say is you can't see your own blind spots, that's why they're called blind spots, right? Like we like to think that, oh, I'm very self-aware. I know my blind spots. You actually don't. And that's why they're blind, right? And I think that if we want to be healthy, holistic, humble human beings, we actually have to invite in external accountability and external structure and an external viewpoint to help us become who we were meant to be. You know, you see these people, the top of their game, no matter what industry they're in, business, you know, singers, performers, athletes, they all have coaches, right? Yeah. You, we That's all need someone. We all need someone who will hold up a mirror for us and reflect back to us the things that we're not even aware that we were saying, right? Like most of my job, people think that being a coach means that you tell people what to do or you give them advice. And I never give my clients advice. We're actually biologically hardwired not to accept advice from other people. It has to come from within ourselves. So my job as a coach is to hold space, to have a judgment-free zone, and then really just to ask questions, to hold up that mirror and be like, this is what I heard you say. Is that what you actually mean? And most of the time I'm hearing between the lines, I'm hearing the things that people aren't saying, the things that we dance around, the, the things we try to minimize, justify, rationalize, explain away for why something feels painful. And so my job as a coach is to bring that to your awareness, because the more awareness you have, the more choices are available to you. And it's not my job to tell you what choice to make. That's your job. You're the subject matter expert in your experience. My job is to make sure that you're informed and that you have options. And so anyone who thinks that they don't need a coach, I would just challenge and say, how's that working out for you? And how do you know you don't need a coach? Because if you haven't worked with one, how do you know that you're living out to your full potential? 
Yeah. And then, you know, to get to the next level, like you said, a lot of people out there, they're really, really successful. And, you know, they made it, you know, to the top of their industry or the top of their profession. Um, they need people in their life that doesn't just tell them how wonderful they are. And a group of friends, you know, just says, hey, everything's good. Don't worry about it. You got to have like accountability. Like you said, that's such an important word. And I feel like if you have a good life coach, that they will hold you accountable and they will challenge, you know, your biases as well and kind of your habits. And a lot of times we've got toxic yeah. behaviors that we can't see, just like you said. I mean, that's, that's really, really important. So I'm not, I'm an, I'm a believer in it. I love it when somebody tells me like, Hey Mark, you know, you're off target. Like I, I value that. Not everybody does, but I do like, I like that shit. <laughs> well, I mean, people who don't value it aren't talking to me. So, you know, right. it, it works right. out. Right. Um, I just wanted to tell everybody also that Talia is uh, she's a big LinkedIn on the social media. Um, again, Talia uh, Bastion Ray, R-H-E-A. And you'll see her information here titled on the screen. But I tell you, man, for out there, you know, she posts things a couple times a week. They're very profound. You know, they're they're very real. Um, and they're very applicable to a lot of the things that you read, maybe what you're going through. So I just I think your influence and your presence on LinkedIn, you know, is probably more meaningful than you think that it is. Because every time I read something I'm like, Jesus, man, this, you know, this, this amazing woman was, you know, a, a <laughs> lieutenant when I was a damn star sergeant. She's like teaching me stuff all the time. Like, so experience and age and perspective, you know, has nothing to do with, you know, how long you've been walking the earth neither. So mm -hmm. thanks for well, giving back. Thank you for saying that. I really, <laughs> I really appreciate that. And, you know, it's funny because when I started coaching, you know, I like to, I tell people that I was actually starting from a deficit, right? I wasn't starting from a net neutral. I was starting from a deficit in that I had a lot of barriers to overcome in my own mind. And I think that's the hardest part about entrepreneurship yes. is you're constantly confronted by your own insecurities, your own like worst traits about yourself are just like on display for you to look at every single day. And there's no working around it, right? Like if you have a a lazy tendency or, you know, you're really critical of yourself like that criticism and that laziness is in front of you to stare at. Right. And there's no one else to blame except yourself. So it's interesting True. because when I started this, I was like, it's going to work with me, you know, like, yep. like who is going to take me seriously? Like I just had all this like inner dialogue of thoughts that were ultimately disempowering. And it's really interesting because my client base is mostly older, retired Marine veterans. And I never would have thought that, you know, I would have thought that my age worked as a disadvantage to me. And it's right. actually an advantage because I think when people are looking for accountability, they're looking for accountability in someone that isn't in their friend group necessarily, right? Because if your friend could, if your friends could help you, you wouldn't be in the situation that you're in. So we're often looking for accountability and structure and perspective from people who aren't like us. And so for better or for worse, I feel like that's worked to my advantage. And I just so appreciate hearing the perspective of my clients because we all are born with and we're given an internal operating system, right? We all have beliefs about things, opinions about things that really aren't our own. They were given to us either from our family of origin or authority figures, the military for sure. And we're not even conscious of this software that's like running in the background, right? And it's not until we stop and we pay attention to that software that we actually start to see like, huh, is there a bug here? Or is this a standard feature that I want to adopt in my life? And then we get to make those choices like I was talking about earlier. So yeah, it's, it's interesting because my internal software would have told me that being young and only having six years of garrison experience in the military, who's going to want to work with me, right? And that right. would have kept me stuck. And that would have kept me in my nine to five a couple years longer, right? And right. when you are aware of those thoughts, you're aware of where they come from, then you can actually choose to do something about it. And in my case, thankfully, in this scenario, I chose to do the opposite. And because of that, we're having this conversation. Yeah, you're so right, Talia, um, about getting over yourself and getting over your internal fears and, you know, your anxiety and what people are going to think and stuff. So my advice would be, first off, you got to if you're going to embark upon a journey like you did like I'm doing here with the podcast. We'll talk about your podcast in a minute, but you got to get kind of like a big old fuck it bucket and sort of got to just, you know, <laughs> just drop it oh. in the fuck it bucket and just go. I mean, 
to get for me to go in the garage and do my first video, um, I did it January 7th uh, of 2023. It was about three months of me convincing myself being like, okay, just you need to just go out there and take the first step and do it. Who cares if it sucks? Publish the damn thing on YouTube and see what freaking happens. You're probably going to be better at it than you think too uh, and all that shit. And I just said, big old fuck it. Fuck it. I'm doing it. Boom. Hit freaking record. First episode I did, the audio sucked. Fuck it. Make better, make the next one better, right? Mm -hmm. Next person that comes on, you know, wearing hats, freaking faces, all shit. You know what? Drop it in the fuck it bucket and freaking grow and get better. So mm -hmm. I appreciate you doing that for your clients. And, uh, and I'll tell everybody that as somebody, you know, who served alongside you and, um, and has, you know, talked to you, you know, the last couple of weeks, you know, warming up to this episode that I highly recommend Talia, you know, if you're looking for some perspective and you're, you know, looking for somebody to help you grow, highly recommend, you know, her to, you know, assist you with that. Oh, well, thank you. All right. So getting ready to wrap up here. Um, but before we wrap up, I want you to tell everybody about uh, your podcast that you do called the Talia Ray Podcast. And you're up to, I think, 25 episodes now. I subscribed on YouTube the other day. Um, you haven't published anything. I want you to try to video in the future, but we'll talk about that <laughs> another time. But um, I listened to your episode with Andrew, and it, it was amazing. But tell everybody all about your podcast, the intent behind it, and sort of, you know, where you want to go with it. The floor is yours. That's a great question. And I wish I had more of an answer for you. So here's the thing. Remember that list I told you about having a podcast before I quit yeah. my, my first corporate job. So that dream came to realization 25 weeks ago. And I called it the Talia Ray podcast because I couldn't think of anything snazzy in the moment. And I'm, I'm open to a rebrand in the future. But for right now, I just want to tell stories. And I really want to tell stories from a leadership perspective. I want to tell the stories that the Marine Corps doesn't platform. I shouldn't say just the Marine Corps. It's really the military doesn't platform, that the veteran community doesn't platform. Because what I've realized in coaching high performers at these like Fortune 500, Fortune 50 companies is it doesn't matter how successful you are on the outside. Everyone is struggling with the same shit. It doesn't matter if they make 80 grand a year or $500,000 a year. Everyone is struggling and going through the same crap. And a lot of the times I hear on these like veteran, you know, podcasts, you know, it's like rah, 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 military, like we're all slapping each other on the back and like it's this kumbaya moment. I think that's great. And like, there's certainly a time and place for that, but you don't realize how many people are struggling behind the scenes and how many people in uniform struggled behind the scenes and the growth that they had to go through. And that was certainly my experience as well. You know, you talked to earlier about the Marine Corps having like that camaraderie. I didn't actually experience that camaraderie in the Marine Corps. You know, I was a single female. I wasn't um, ugly. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of got held at, at arm's length a lot of the time. I wasn't mentored by my officer peers and I was alone for a lot of my career. No one knows that story. And wow. I wanted to talk about those real issues. And so, you know, my podcast is still developing and still trying to flesh out the theme. But I think the thing that will continue regardless of the direction that it goes in is I want to tell real stories. You know, I say it in my introduction, they're raw, real and slightly irreverent. And that's my style. And so for anyone who wants to, to listen along and if that's your if that's your vibe, I'm here for it. Yeah, I, I respect that. I respect the grind. I respect the hustle because the journey is not easy to try to, you know, be consistent with podcasts. And it's a very, very difficult thing to do. A lot of things got to line up and it's a hard thing to do. So I'm glad that you're doing it. I do it for um, a lot of the reasons that you talked about earlier, as far as like mental health things. And uh, that's why I do it. I mean, for me, it's like my my escape. So I enjoy it a lot, but it is no doubt a very, very difficult thing to do. But hey, you're doing it. Um, so I really enjoyed yeah. the episode of you and Andrew. So that would be the one I'd recommend to everybody out there that if you were going to listen to Talia's, drop that one with um and I forgot the gentleman's last name, but his first name's Andrew. It's it's pretty it's a pretty real discussion. And um I like what you're doing out there in the space. Yeah. And the other thing, Talia, I'll say to you is Thank that you. as as you continue to grow it and you continue to put into it. You know, everybody is evolving and everybody is making adjustments along the way. Unless your name is Joe Rogan or Sean Ryan, we're all back at the, you know, at the <laughs> whiteboard doing things, being like, oh, you know, trying to make it, you know, better and refine and everything. And so, yeah, I like it. A hundred percent. I mean, my journey. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Um, so I always, with all my guests, uh, before, you know, um, I let you go get your, you know, your free time would be, uh, last minute save rounds, any, you know, advice, shout outs, family, anything like the floor is yours, you know, as we wrap up here, go ahead, my friend. Well, I do want to say thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been great to reconnect and yeah. you know catch up after all these years. But if I had to leave your audience with one piece of advice, it would be you don't have to constantly look backwards. Who are you looking forward? I think that a lot of times as veterans, we're trained to run away from things, right? Bad bosses, toxic leadership environments, you know, who we don't want to be. But we're not as clear on who or what we're running to. And I think that when we get clear on that, it really does set the trajectory for where we're going and the direction that we're headed in. And it's much healthier, ultimately, to run toward the thing that you want and not away from the thing that you don't. So if you're having some trouble doing that, you know, find accountability. I'm biased, but find a coach. Doesn't have to be me, but there are so many amazing coaches out there. And my life changed when I stopped performing and doing what other people expected of me and really listened to what my gut was telling me really my whole life. And I had just been ignoring it. So do the thing you're scared to do. That's amazing advice. I mean, just per perfect, perfect. I, I respect, you know, your courage to, you know, make a full pivot, you know, in your life and, uh, and give up, you know, that, that comfort. It's, it takes, it definitely takes some courage to do it and some risk as well. Um, yeah. pursue your passions period, you know, uh, pursue what you want to do. Don't yes. worry. And don't worry about what the hell are, if you're worried about what everybody thinks about you, you're not going to get where you need to go. You just, again, big old fuck it bucket. Yeah. It is what it is. Just freaking roll with it. So I respect. I'm going to adopt that. I'm going to. Yeah. The next. There you go. <laughs> I respect your grind. I respect your hustle. And, um, cannot thank you enough for spending, you know, time with us this evening. Um, your journey has been exceptional. And again, you know, I hope that, I hope that the audience, hope you can take something, you know, that Talia said, you know, look, at, look, look within yourself, you know, make your life just a little bit better. So, um, truly appreciate you, Talia. Thanks for coming on. Thank you.